I think it will be really good to clarify how we identify first before we speak about our experiences. So how do you identify, Jason? I identify as an out and proud gay man. Mm -hmm. How about yourself? Um, I normally tend to say a member of the LGBTQ plus community, <laughs> or if people want me to be a bit more specific, I say queer. Um, I know there are generational conflicts around this term, but, um, you know, having been an insult and then being reclaimed by younger generations, but I just really like the vagueness about both terms. And I think this vagueness is actually really political and important. Um, because it allows for fluidity, which is, I think, really important. And I kind of, I kind of, you know, don't allow people that noisiness and sometimes entitlement to ask me in detail about my sex life. So it's a bit more on my own terms and conditions, which I really like. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. It's one of the reasons why I identify and tell people gay, because I feel that it's yeah. quite a politically charged term as well. And so I specifically say that because obviously there's nuances to everything. I used to have girlfriends um, in the early days, but I would never and never have identified as bisexual, for example. Mm. I have always thought of myself as being a gay man. And because that term has so much history to it and has yeah. itself been reclaimed from back in the day, it's yeah. one that I identify the most with. But it's interesting you say that. I think mm. we live in a world now where people are so much more conscious of identity yeah. and embracing your own true identity and self and having others show you that respect as well. So it's interesting that yeah. no matter how we choose to identify ourselves with monikers, we're all part of one big family. Yes. And that's really, I think, the most powerful thing that we can um, yeah. experience in today's world. Yeah. I, you know, I sometimes think the term LGBTQ+, whatever, all the letters that are, are now coming, it being added to it, there are so many differences um, because there's so many different identity aspects. It's about sexuality, you know, sexual attraction preferences, potentially. It's about whether you feel sexually attraction at all and under which circumstances, but then it's about gender and it can be about your body in terms of sex chromosomes. And so there are so many different identities, but I think, as we said earlier, focusing on what unites us is really helpful um, that we come together and that we are all together experiencing still um, non-normativity around our identities. And that will, of course, shape how others interact with us. So yeah, I think it's sometimes challenging because there's so many differences and nuances to identities linked to that acronym. But I like to focus on being united and similarities, as you said, yeah. Definitely. And something that I really enjoyed when I first moved to the UK in 2004 was that yeah. I, mean, I came from a very conservative world, but coming here and having everybody refer to their other half as their partner is a very yes. non-gender specific way. And in my mind, I thought, is it a male partner? Is it a female partner? Is it an other partner? Mm -hmm. What is going on? Everyone's got partners. So it was really interesting is that people didn't feel the need to say my girlfriend or boyfriend, my husband or wife, or it was just my significant other, but specifically yeah. partner. And I love that because um, it shouldn't matter yeah. what gender or how you identify what your partner is or is not. It's just the fact that you have someone who is your other half. And maybe perhaps you have multiple other halves. So something else that I had discovered about meeting people who are in trios and morsums and polyamorous. So this yes. is a beautiful spectrum of, of all different ways that we live our lives. And I think that the numbers that say we're X percentage of the population are a lie. If everybody were truly honest with themselves, I would think that the majority of us are somewhere on the spectrum as opposed to fitting yeah. only in one category. Yeah, yeah. I like I like that openness too. It kind of, it, to me, it sometimes feel like expanding horizons. So I also moved to the UK from somewhere else. So I, I'm not local in that sense. I'm Austrian. And sometimes, you know, now experiencing the UK and Cambridge specifically, it just puts what I've known before in perspective and makes me aware of some of these limitations of what I even could imagine. You know, so I, I, it, to me, it's very freeing um, engaging with the LGBTQ plus community and experiencing a celebration and safety, of course, which is a massive privilege around this identity at the space that's so central to everything I do in a university, you know. Um, so 
Yeah, I, I think sometimes if you have the comparison, it means even more to you than if you just take it for granted. I don't know what you think. Definitely. And it's, it's so important to the experience in Cambridge as well. That's exactly what I found because I came out in Cambridge. I hadn't realized. I always knew that there was something different about me. You know, the signs were there, obviously, but there's something I quite suppressed because of cultural and just environmental reasons. Um, it was a safety mechanism. I was bullied, et cetera, like so many of us have been. And then coming to Cambridge it was the first time where I felt free because my only experience had been either being home in a very religiously conservative like environment where I grew up or um, going to school in New Orleans, which was very hyper liberal and very kind of out and very kind of radical um, and not knowing where I fit in. Because I kept thinking to myself, well, obviously I feel different inside and I'm suppressing it. But then when I went to these more kind of radical out crowd, like private, you know, and I didn't feel I felt it fit in there either. So I kind of fell between the cracks. I was thinking, well, I don't know who I am. And then coming to Cambridge, people just took me as a person and it was the first time in my life I've ever experienced someone just looking at me as, oh, you're Jason, that's great. Tell me about yourself. And there's yeah. something about the culture here that individualism and like eccentrism, and you're allowed to have all these facets to your personality. Whereas where I grew up, you are very much put into a bucket. Like you're either X or Y, you're either A or B. Yeah. And that was so refreshing and blew my mind. And it, it created a safe environment where I could actually explore and discover who I truly was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How powerful. I mean, I, I really, I really touched by, by what you just said. Yeah, that resonates a lot with, with my experience too, for sure. So how was it the first time that when you when you came out at Cambridge, you know, with the background you've experienced before? How, how was that? Oh, well, it was interesting because I kind of went through this um, revelation so it happened actually because I was in my lab and I, you know, I'd had a couple of girlfriends before and nothing was working out. I was feeling a bit you know, down on myself. And one of my lab members said, you know, Jason, maybe you're gay. And I said, I know, what do you mean? No, oh, no, of course not, no, what do you mean? He said, you know, I don't even like guys. All my friends are girls, I don't like guys. <laughs> I remember that in that conversation. And my friend at the time said, okay, yes. Well, you know, it's not meant to be an offensive thing, but you know, there is a gay night in town on Tuesdays Maybe you might want to go and maybe you might want to meet some people, meet some other students. And I thought, no. But then one night, it was a Tuesday night, I remember this clearly. I thought, no one will ever find out. I'm just going to go out to this gay student night and no one will ever know back home. And, you know, like, of course, I'll just, I'll go and I won't tell anyone. And it'll turn out that I'm definitely, it'll confirm I'm definitely not gay. And I went. And at first I felt, you know, really awkward and sitting there. And I started talking to people. And the next thing I knew, my mind just went, wow, I'm gay. <laughs> this is what's been missing. I understand now. And I got to meet, you know, not what the stereotype was on the television at that time, but people from all different ways, you know, from all different walks of life, all different ethnicities, different religions, different um, ways of being. And it just opened my mind. And I thought, that I'm home, finally. And then I went and told everybody that I knew. It was kind of like the first thing I would say when I met them. It's like, hi, I'm Jason, guess what, I'm gay. Just the random people and be like, okay, that's nice, good for you. And I felt in a way I needed that because I needed that affirmation. Mm -hmm. And it was great to be in a place like Cambridge where people were like, oh, that's great. But it was never the defining um, feature of me. It was just, yeah. oh, that's great, nice to meet you. Yeah. And I love that. And I really needed that environment to have the confidence to be able to come out to my family and come out to some of my friends back home who had, let's say, a very different reaction. Right. Yeah. yeah. How about yourself? Mm, well, okay, so as I said, I'm Austrian. And um, before I came to Cambridge, I already spent a year at Oxford. And that's why I kind of got into LGBTQ plus studies. So kind of my UK university experiences are very much in that context. And I think it's important because it's a very unique con uh, context, I think, to be out and in terms of my visibility as well. Now at Cambridge though, it's, it's truly extraordinary. Um, I mean, I kind of see Cambridge like a bubble and then I see sub bubbles to this bigger bubble, you know, your department or lab in, in your case, the college um, and then certain friend groups and circles. So they're kind of like all these bubbles, right? And I acknowledge that 
within at least within my bubbles, I am extremely celebrated and supported, not just accepted. It goes way beyond that, basically, um, in my identity. And that's because of my research groups. It's because also of my subject where LGBTQ plus sexuality gender studies, it's valid, it's considered important, it's respectable, you know. Um, I don't know how that was for you in, in doing a medicine degree, but we can talk about it in a second. So I, I just feel really good about my hyper visibility, as I sometimes call it, because um, I am, you know, if you Google me, I Googled myself the other week, you know, and every side it basically says LGBTQ plus because I'm an LGBTQ plus researcher. So I'm really associated with that. But then I'm a qualitative researcher, which means I'm always very transparent about my own positionality. So I'm constantly outing myself and it's part of my job in a way. So again, slightly different. And then I'm doing research within Cambridge. So I talk a lot about being out in Cambridge to Cambridge. So I, I'm just really hyper visible, but I feel very safe and celebrated and supported in that visibility, which is just wonderful. I truly wish everyone could experience that if they want to be that visible, you know, it's always a bit of a decision, of course, do you feel comfortable with that as well? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think everyone has to make that decision for themselves, but knowing yeah. that you can be in an environment where you have that choice, and that yeah. you are encouraged and supported to do so and be as out and yeah. proud and open as you feel comfortable yeah. doing is what is the ideal because maybe some people don't want to be out um, yeah. as loud as we do, but others yeah. of us, um, we have that platform where we can be. And I think it's yeah. fantastic that we live in a place where um, you have professors and students and people in the town that, you know, the, I can see the pride flag a raise of a, of a hospital or in the, you know, council hall in town. I remember a couple of years ago, First Cambridge Pride as well, which was fantastic to attend. And it's really a safe haven yeah. for yeah. us all. And sometimes that's just what you need. And again, there's this idea I feel that particularly being in such an academic environment that you tend to find people are more liberal in their thinking and more open-minded if yeah. they are studying. It's not you know an absolute, but yeah. I find that's definitely the trend in Cambridge that we have this liberal academic leaning bent where once you've educated yourself and met people from around the world and have traveled, you can't help but expand your mind. And yes. that's such a wonderful feeling. Uh, even when it comes to, when I was here in, in uh, you know, the early 2000s, I remember you know, going on that journey myself and time and time again, encountering people who they felt that because I was out there shouting from the rooftops, hey, I figured this out, I, I finally get it, I understand yeah. that they were opening up too and they were telling me their journeys and so, incredible just to hear those stories and to meet those people because we were just at the beginning of I think the kind of post Ellen Will and Grace kind of you know phase of gay and LGBTQ kind of issues being at the forefront of people's minds. Um, I came back to Cambridge with my partner in 2010 mm -hmm. and we got married here and we now have our son here and this is where our life is particularly yeah. because this is the environment that we're in and I, I still remember how proud my husband was when in his lab where he works at the hospital, they put a photo of us up when we got married. Aww. And there was actually a lesbian couple who had gotten married recently too. This was back when marriage, uh, gay marriage became legal in yeah. the UK. And it was wonderful. And everybody stood up and applauded and he was so moved. And that's the kind of world that we live in here. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty special. Um, and I think because it's my research topic as well. You know, I am obviously I'm aware that's not how it is for everyone. And I teach at many different universities around the world and that's not how it is everywhere, right? And not for everyone. And I, yeah, I, I truly, truly wish everyone, as I said earlier, can have this amazing experience of not just acceptance and tolerance. I really dislike the term <laughs> tolerance. I think though it still indicates an unequal power dynamic of someone else being better or more or, or superior in a way because of how they are within this world. And then tolerating the other person saying, despite 
of how and who you are, I tolerate you in the space. I really, I really dislike this term. I never felt tolerated in Cambridge and within my research group and within my college. I never felt tolerated. I always felt really welcomed, encouraged and celebrated. So yeah, it's, and I think that's where we should get at, you know? And also, as you said earlier, the point where you're not being reduced to that part of yourself. It becomes more the normality more it's it's less non-normative maybe as in other parts or in other universities at least that's what my experience is of comparing them so people just don't tend to focus so much or give like all this meaning of this one part of your identity right um like oh elizabeth is queer that's now all that's interesting and, and relevant about elizabeth right yeah it, I, I never felt like that and it's very freeing mm. I think, you know, that's, that's absolutely right. I feel exactly the same way. You know, it's a part of who I am. It's an important part, but it's only a part. Um, I also say that I'm Afro-Caribbean. I am an immigrant from the States, an American as well. Um, a husband, a son, a father, all these things, a scientist, a business person, an entrepreneur. Uh, these are all facets of who we are. And that point on tolerance versus acceptance, I think is so true. We can't forget that we do live in this bubble of privilege when we get to be here and experience this, but we can't forget those who are still struggling, who live yes. in cities and countries and cultures where it is much harder for them. I know for a fact that, for example, in Afro-Caribbean culture, there's still a lot of stigma around um, being homosexual. Yeah. And parts of Jamaica, where my family is from, that I can't visit now because I right. refuse to hide in the closet anymore for anyone. Yeah. I hope that changes someday, but it's the reality. I also know that there are communities even here in uh, Cambridge where it's challenging yeah. Yeah. for people to be able to live their true life. I have a friend who was recently told by his parents that he has to leave or go to gay conversion therapy. Even though it's been made right. illegal, they've told him right. that's the only choice because they're very religious. This is here today. So yeah. we can't forget those who are still struggling and we have yeah. to use our platforms to always be out and proud but make sure that we continue to fight for the rights that others don't have. Yeah, I totally agree. It makes me think of what pride means because I I was aware that this question was coming today. So I was having a big thing. What does pride mean to me? Um, and I, on so, and that's my very personal answer because again, I, I don't think I can speak for everyone and do everyone justice at all. So that's very much how I feel it, about it. But um, to me, it's the, on the one hand, it's the opposite of shame. So it's all about self-acceptance and kind of working against internal and external structures to tell you that you're not good or you're not good enough because you're not fitting into certain categories or norms, right? So it's about this unconditional love of oneself and others um, and saying you are good and you are enough just in being and not because you are a certain way. And so I think, Pride can be all about celebrating this love and joy. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's a really important, it's an occasion to remember, to remind oneself and to familiarize oneself with the ongoing struggles that are still very much present beyond one's own bubble, to kind of use the term you referred to earlier, um, and to kind of also see the disproportionate struggles within the LGBTQ plus community, because some, I think, are more privileged than others. Um, and yeah, then fight against that basically together in solidarity, right? Um, because even if you have arrived at a good state, if you are in an environment where you are safe or your identity, you know, where you can be out and proud safely, um, it doesn't mean that everyone else can and they might want to. So it's it's about let's not forget that the first pride was a riot right kind of in that in that sense yeah no, you know it's so interesting how we have these monikers like lgbtqia plus yeah. yes. but even within our own community we have silos and fractions so we're not monolithic even in ourselves and their cultures and subcultures. And that makes part of this beautiful, diverse group that we are proud to be part of this family. 
and pride, you know, to build on what you were saying, is about family. Mm -hmm. A lot of us in the queer community, we get to choose our family. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes because our biological families might reject us. Right. And in that choosing, there's something so powerful and so fundamentally human around finding community and finding that kind of safe space where you can flourish and really achieve, achieve your true potential. But what we can't forget is that sometimes even within our own family, we might not be as accepting as we should of each other. We know that um, our trans brothers and sisters are disproportionately affected by a lot of violence in the um, you know, community. We know that non-binary individuals and asexual individuals sometimes feel like they've been marginalized and left out of the conversation. So it's up to us now that we have ridden the wave of pride all these years to make sure that we are lifting everybody up with us. Yeah. And I think it's something that we can't get too comfortable about. Same thing when it comes to um, gender and ethnicity, et cetera, and overlaying that with our queer identity. Is there's so many different facets to our community itself. I think that we have to be always conscious that the work's not done yeah. and that we have to wedge the door open for whoever else is coming behind us. That's the analogy that comes to my head. It's like, oh, you've opened the door, that's great. But don't shut it behind you, wedge it open. It's a common yeah. issue about immigrants. You get a wave of immigrants and then they go, oh, those other immigrants coming in. Oh, we don't like them. You think, hold on a second. <laughs> now it's your turn to pay it forward to the next groups coming through. Yeah. So let's be as generous and as um, caring for them as we've benefit, benefited from our allies. We have to be allies for ourselves as well as expecting others outside of the community to be allies for us. Yes, yes. And I think one good, one act of kindness and one good deed, that's going to be really cheesy now, by the way, but I truly feel like that. It's really playing, it's, it's multiplating in a way, a way, right? I am so inspired by the kindness and support and unapologetic support I was being given here that I really want to pass that on. So, yeah. And let's not forget again what, what others did for us that you know not let's not take for granted what we have now and make sure that next generations at least have the same level if not more um than than we had yeah yeah and it comes back to the bubble let's expand it so it envelops the world it doesn't have to be a bubble it shouldn't be a bubble it should be all inclusive yes yes exactly yeah so I mean, you, you, you're still living in Cambridge, right? How is it, you know, and I mean, obviously, I, I, I imagine you see the university buildings a lot and you have all these memories associated with certain spaces and places, right? How do you think back of your time at Cambridge and your sexual orientation? Yeah, so it's interesting. I will say that when I first got here, I thought it was very small. I have to be perfectly honest because I just come from a large city, New Orleans, and it was a complete culture shock for me coming here. Um, you know, I had experienced proper wind for the first time. I'd never heard of a duvet. I remember, the, I remember sleeping in my wool coat in my room because I was so cold. I was like, oh, I'm freezing. I didn't know how to work the radiators. That was, it was kind of ridiculous. And then I had some very lovely, kind people in my lab. Um, you know, shout out to Kathy and Suzanne if they're listening, but who introduced me to the joys of, you know, making sure I had proper clothing. And they lent me an electric blanket and all these type of things. And it's, it was a very warm welcome coming yeah. to campus. And same thing for the, the members of my college and the staff there. It's been very warm and welcoming and saying, it's okay, we know you've never left the States before. This is your first time. Yeah. <laughs> really different in culture, but it's great. You know, you'll, you'll fit right in. And I think the only thing I look back on is before I was fully aware of my sexuality, I was dealing with my own form of depression because I was very sad and I couldn't ever articulate or explain why and it was holding me back mm -hmm. and so for about a good maybe a year and a half or so when I first got here I was really sad you know homesick away from home but that was something I could deal with I had family in London I could visit which was great mm -hmm. but I was this very withdrawn and quiet person in myself because there was something that just wasn't right and anytime somebody would ask me about oh are you dating are you this or that I find ways to dodge the question and everything but I didn't really understand what it was about. And I realized that at my core, I was so afraid of disappointing my family and disappointing the world that I had really just suppressed my sexuality so deep down 
it was becoming cancerous inside of me. And so I didn't realize that my unhappiness was stemming from not being able to be my true self. I was always attributing it, oh, maybe it's the weather, maybe I want to do this, maybe I want to go out more. But it didn't matter where I was, I could be at cinema, I could be out for drinks with mates, I could be visiting family. I was always sitting in the corner, quietly by myself, feeling miserable, but not really understanding why. And so when I finally did embrace that side of me, and I felt in a safe environment to do so, being here in Cambridge, it changed the world for me. I'm not saying that it was easy sailing after that. I mean, I did have, you know, challenges of dealing with some work colleagues on occasion, dealing with family and, you know, hoping, helping them come around and understanding who I am. Now, all those things are a distant memory, but in those early days, I'm so glad that I was here and I had such a supportive community around me to give me that, that um, permission, that safe space, that confidence to come out and meet my first partner at the time and really learn that it wasn't all of the fears that would have been put into me by um, certain members of my community, that it was a death sentence, that um, nobody would ever want to see me again, that I'd be cut off from my family forever, that um, you can imagine all of these thoughts and some of them reinforced by certain family members I had that were weighing on me. Yeah. And to learn that they were all false. Yeah. And to have people that loved me unconditionally, who were supportive, and said that, you know, it's not going to ruin your career, Jason. Actually, quite the opposite. We've never seen you so happy. My experiment started working. I was shining. I was traveling again. Like all these things happened for me. And it stemmed from that deep sadness I had from being in the closet. Yeah. Um, one, one COVID hit. Um, I was forced, well, I was very lucky to be able to travel back to Austria and be safe there, so I'm very grateful, but I did not expect to move back, and I have been here for almost one and a half years, which is insane, but um, it just hit me so hard, it was just after LGBT History Month in February, and as an LGBT plus researcher, I was going to more events than I could count <laughs> like it was insane and then it was it was just such the opposite when I arrived here so I wrote this blog this reflective piece basically I, I called it away from queer ha my queer heaven basically and being back in my conservative country of origin and I kind of reflected I chucked the post and in there I noticed I think sometimes we need a safe haven, ha haven, as you said. We need a space to um, experience being unconditionally loved and accepted and just being. And I think letting that nurture us. So when we then return to spaces where it might not be like that yet, um, we can encounter, we can interact with them in a strengthened, healed way. Um, and I think then it's the true question, how much have you internalized, you know, self-love and self-acceptance? How much have you um, maybe fought against some of these really harmful um, beliefs about yourself that you were being told maybe by, by others, you know? I think that's when the, the, the test kind of happens, but how important it is then to kind of rejuvenate first and allow healing to happen within a safe environment, especially at the age you normally tend to be at the university as a student, how important for one's development, for one's reinvention, right? Um, in a way to, to have that, to then go outside of the bubble, to go out to the wider world where that might, acceptance might not be the case and that safety might not be the case yet, but to then be able to fight it stronger in a sense. Well, exactly. It's almost like you get recharged. Yes. And then you maintain that because you have the tools to make sure that people aren't going to drag you back down. You say, actually, no, I know my self-worth. I have the yes. tools to, be able to deal with these pressures outside, but at least you have some relief. It's like when, you, when you're running a marathon and then you finally stop and you think, oh my gosh, I'm knackered. That's yes. the kind of environment where it is where you can just breathe yeah. and just, um, as I said, recharge, that's yeah. so important. And then you have that confidence, you have that strength to go out and be a beacon for other people. Because I, I can tell you that when I go back home, 
Um, of course, times change, but in that conservative environment that I grew up in, in that in that you know, the deep south in the states, I can go back with my husband and hopefully soon with our son and hold our heads up high and really have that confidence to go anywhere and do anything. And yes, of course, we'll get the odd stare and we'll get the odd comment, but that's just life. You'd be surprised, I think, when you present yourself with confidence, just how it gives other people confidence in themselves mm -hmm. and they actually enjoy it. I think when we live in shame and we hide, sometimes it actually reinforces the thought process for others that we have something to be ashamed of. Yeah, yes. That we should be hiding. But when we don't, they actually check their own assumptions and understanding. They go, oh, actually, yeah. you're right. You are normal. There's yeah. nothing wrong. And I, it's really funny. I remember we went back for a wedding. Um, my partner and I was telling you it was one of the first times we'd gone to a wedding in my home state in a very conservative city, even more so than where I grew up. And I said, okay, just so you know, we're going here. They have Confederate flags. They have guns. They voted for Trump. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> we're an international, interracial gay couple. Yes, and we were going and it'll be fine. We'll support each other. And can I tell you, Elizabeth, when we went, we had the best time. Mm -hmm. Everybody embraced us. It was phenomenal. It was just incredible. And it made me check some of my own assumptions as well, because I went in there prepared to be like, right, I'm, you know, everyone's going to be questioning and everyone's going to be pushing back and I've got to be ready. No, people just said, oh, this is so wonderful. So great to see you guys. You guys are so cute together. And I thought, hold on a second. There's something really powerful in this one-on-one -on -one interaction. So even though politically on the surface, it may seem like they were pro this and pro that and you know, voting for uh, politicians who may not have um, queer interests at their heart, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, people are human and they recognize that. So I have to believe that we will get to the point where if enough of us are um, confident in who we are and we allow that to shine so that others can experience it, that we will make this world a more accepting place. Yes. We'll get there. I, I lived it. We're living it now. I'm sure you're experiencing it too. We're moving in the right direction. It's hard at times, but I'm confident we're going to get there. Yeah. And I, just to add to that, um, of course, you can disagree with me, <laughs> but it kind of made me think of it. Even if people don't fully believe in it yet, you know, I think that takes time, that takes encounter with people. So it's, I think it's easier to, to attack people you feel there is some distance and no similarity between, you know, like othering people basically and, you know, being nasty to them because they are far away or at least you push them away and you think of no similarity. That's what I love about qualitative research because it reminds audiences, it reminds people who engage with it, that there are real people behind it. And even if you don't identify the same or even have the same experiences, there's similarities in simply being human. And I think that can lead to empathy. So it's incredibly powerful. Um, but even if people aren't ready yet or just are still, don't allow themselves to be touched and moved and changing, um, just in altering that meaning structure what we give to being a same-sex couple or like interracial couple or being LGBTQ, AI plus whatever, and just be saying, no, I am here. I deserve to be here. I deserve to be seen. I'm not ashamed. I'm stepping up for it. You kind of change the meaning structure around it. And at least even if people don't sold on it yet, and I hope, of course, for them, they get there. But even if they don't, at least notice being now being discriminatory wouldn't be accepted anymore, you know. So I think ideally we all move to the state where we just where we just prioritize kindness and encounter with others and see the similarities of being human beings. We are not focusing in a restrictive way on differences, but see similarities, whatever that is, even like within our family or to expand family, you know? Um, but until that, yes, I think people being unapologetically out and visible and there helps changing some of that meaning structure and which hopefully then makes it safer for other people who don't feel safe enough yet because they're either disproportionately vulnerable or they just don't want to be out yet. Because I, I really think 
I personally fight a bit against that idea that you're only good, a good queer, a good gay, if you are out and that you're only living your true self if you're out. I mean, for many people, that's an experience they had and it's lovely, but I also think we shouldn't just expect and demand outness and visibility because I think we then forget what's at stake for many people still. But yes, visibility helps to creating a more safe environment. So it's a bit of a complex one, visibility. But yeah, I think if you if one is comfortable and feels safe to be out, I think one should for oneself, but also for others. You know, Elizabeth, I think that's so important, a message. There's a world where you have the option to be out if you choose yeah. to. Yeah. That's the world that we should be creating. Because if you're straight, you don't ever have to come out as straight. Mm -hmm. Nobody says, hey, guess what? <laughs> you know, I'm giving you here's my TikTok message. I'm straight, just so you know, please don't <laughs> judge me. I'm proud of who I am. Like, no, <laughs> they don't have that. So this idea that somehow adding another layer of stress uh, typically coming from within our own community to other members of our community saying you're not out that means you're ashamed of who you are you're not out that means you're not a real gay you're not a real queer you're not proud of who you are is yeah. nonsensical yes. we should all be working towards a world where people can be as out and proud as they want to be exactly and that's that's the the world that we should yeah. be uh, you know yeah. creating and i think that sometimes we can be just as guilty mm -hmm. of being a bit too um, unaccepting and maybe just tolerant um, in ourselves, that it's really quite sad. And I think hopefully we do learn that empathy that you mentioned earlier for even people in our own community. Yeah. I remember actually, it's quite funny. Everybody has an opinion, I say. Uh, when I and my husband, when we got married, well, actually when we got engaged, we had a couple of gay friends, um, you know, from all different as aspects of the spectrum who actually were annoyed slash upset because they said that being queer is about being radical and that marriage is this social construct that's all part mm -hmm. of the you know, okay. hetero patriarchal world that we live in. So why on earth would we, as liberal, open-minded, educated gay men, choose to get married and um, you know, uh, sign up to this, this antiquated construct? And I thought, well, we love each other <laughs> and it's our decision and it's actually the right move for us. And there's things in it that are emotional, there's things in it that are political, and there's also things in it that are practical in terms of making sure that we have a stable family home and structure and get access to the over 300 odd benefits that you do as a married couple. But it's funny that even in moments like that, where you think, oh, this is progress, we're moving in the right direction, people will say, well, you know, you're not really gay because you got married. Or looking at uh, Drag Race, which I think is a phenomenal uh, show from you know, RuPaul, there are people who say, wow, oh, drag should never be mainstream. And what have you done? You've made a mockery of this uh, kind of revolutionary art form that comes from a certain context. So it's funny how we are even hypercritical of ourselves. And I think this kind of debate and discourse is great to being in Cambridge, where you can meet people who have yes. a different aspect and opinions, and you can have an open conversation about it. And that's like, I think that's something that needs to happen too. Yes. We can't assume that we all are on the same page or all have the same kind of opinions, but we need to be in a space where you can have those debates and yeah. have it in a constructive way. But yeah. also understanding that maybe we should just not be so hard on ourselves as in, in the community and be but more accepting. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, we're certainly not free of guilt at all. <laughs> I mean, that, we all that, do it. We all do it. Yeah. I mean, that expectation of being out and clearly labeling yourself sometimes. I personally, I don't just experience it outside of the community, but also within, you know, so, and, and I, and I sometimes um, encounter myself like on an inner level, you know, I, I notice, oh my goodness, you just had this expectation. We're kind of probing for how this person identifies. Like, and, and, and this is my reason topic you know certainly not free of it at all i think uh, it's important though to to notice it and to be aware and to and to maybe also acknowledge that needs and lifestyles are different you know again coming back to not everyone has the same experiences not everyone has the same needs you know even if you identify the same 
I mean, first of all, there are other social categories that intersect. So your positionality is never identical in that, in that sense. And I think it's important to allow room and space and acknowledgement for differentials in terms of vulnerabilities, but also, you know, unique experiences. But with that, you also have different needs and different personalities. So to kind of allow for that. And I think it's easy to say, oh, I'm part of a minority. I know, you know, I know it all. <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I think it comes to that empathy and sympathy side always. Um, yeah. You should be open to listening and understanding the experiences of others, but you should never say that because I am X, I understand why. Yeah, you exactly. can say you can relate, you can appreciate what they're going through. You're yeah. open and you can understand their experience, but everybody has a different aspect. And at the end of the day, we are individual people too. So yeah. you might be a member of one community, but if you're a member of two, then you have a different experience. So if, yeah. uh, for example, you are a queer woman, mm -hmm. I am a black gay man. There are mm -hmm. people who are trans, people who are non-binary, there are people who are everything under the sun. And we all have our stories to tell because, you know, being a young queer woman from Austria and living in Cambridge could be a very different experience than if you were from, say, Syria or if you were from California, who knows? And vice versa for me, like my experience very much is grounded in growing up in the deep south, but also having Caribbean roots and now living in, in Cambridge. So there are all these different facets to who we are that make it so important for us to just listen to one another. Yes. I, I think sometimes that we do as human beings, I think it's easier for our minds to process putting people in buckets. So even though we don't want to be uh, put into those kind of categories ourselves and say, no, actually, you know, there's a lot more to me than that. When we meet new people, I think our brain automatically goes to, it's easier to process if I put you in bucket A, B, or C. Because yeah. otherwise, how can I engage? Oh, I know everything about you because you're this. And you go, actually, no, you're a human being too. Let me learn about you. But it's something we have to consciously make an effort to do. Yeah. That's exactly what I treasure so much about my work. It's a massive privilege that I get to interact with people and get to listen and learn um, and leave myself aside for an hour, three hours. I mean, I will make sense of what they say through my perspective and lens and positionality, of course, but to really ignore or like allow myself to be surprised allow myself to have my mind expanded and what I took for granted and what I thought I knew and was the world and to listen to others and their stories I think it makes it makes one a very humble person um I'm not saying I'm fully there yet but I think it, it allows one to be humble because you again see your own experiences on the perspective and you notice your privileges and yeah you learn you expand and how i mean that's in a way to me that's a sense what a university should be allowing these moments of encounter to challenge what you thought you knew allowing yourself daring to rethink things or imagine different ways of it and have open discussions around it and therefore grow as a as a as a being as a as a scientist as a whatever you happen to do afterwards you know it's such a personal development so if a university isn't lgbt plus inclusive to me it's just such a contradiction <laughs> you know um in a way and i i feel cambridge really is on the right path um, and in the bubbles I encountered, I'm incredibly lucky and supportive. So, yeah. I think that we also have to make sure that we continue to expand that bubble, as we said earlier. The university is really doing more and more to open its doors to the community. I think people often forget that Cambridge is more than just the university. We've yeah. got two universities here. We've got a pretty large community that's yes. expanding. Lots of young professionals, people who've been here historically with generations. And it's making sure that we can open the doors and help bring that openness and 
that conversation to everybody. And I yeah. think that would be, for me, yeah. one of the best outcomes that the university yeah. is able to say, not only have we created this space, but also yeah. it's inclusive. Yeah. Um, English Pride was a great example. I remember it was out in Jesus Green and it was so much fun, but everybody was there. University students, people from community, people were coming in from uh, the surrounding villages just to feel free and open. And that is incredible. That's what we want. Yeah. So I would challenge anybody who's listening to this that don't just assume if you're um, in the university that it stops there. And also don't feel that if you're not a part of the university formally that you can't benefit from this discourse from what we are describing because yeah. it should be open for all. And I know that we very much want to lift up Cambridge and the rest of the UK and hopefully the rest of the world at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, Jason, for reminding me and many, I think, of that. It's so easy to be so centered and sometimes feeling entitled when being in Cambridge. But, you know, Speak of myself here. Yeah, I'm very critical of it, I hope, as a social scientist of exactly what's going on here. Um, but yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, in my research, uh, PhD research around LGBT plus experiences at Cambridge, it was so important to me to not just talk to students and academics, but to give equal voices, equal amounts of space in terms of interview numbers to people who work in college gardens, to people who work in college kitchens, who are part of the maintenance team, who are um, in museums, in Cambridge Assessment, Cambridge Press, and that's still Cambridge, you know, of course there's um, so much more be beyond that. Uh, it's just a starting point, but just widening the idea of what Cambridge means, um, who has access to it, for whom is it, being made and is it there today? Um, for whom does it have relevance and impact? You know, kind of expanding that idea of Cambridge and you reminded me again of that. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, I know it's, um, I think it's incredible the work that you do. I think it's great that there's actually support for understanding that all those different aspects of our community and experience. It reminds me actually of a friend of mine, uh, you know, in early days, I had never met anybody that I knew was trans. And so I spent some time really trying to educate myself and get my head around it because I had my science side of my head thinking like trying to understand scientifically how this works, but then also the emotional side and there's a personal thinking, okay, I'm just trying to understand. And it's something you can't take for granted. Like we're always learning, we're always works in progress. One of our really close friends, um, he came out to us that he was trans and we had no idea. And he told us his whole experience about his transition. He, you know, worked at the university and it blew my mind. I thought we've been friends for all these years and I had no idea. I, I, it just, and I went, wow. And suddenly it brought into sharp focus that, okay, I understand. And it was interesting that no amount of reading or watching YouTube videos or the like abstract concept really brought it home to me, but just hearing his personal story and journey, yeah. it all became crystal clear. And I was like, right, okay, now I get it. Thank yeah. you so much. And I felt so privileged that he felt comfortable enough to come out to us specifically. It was like the biggest gift he could ever give. And I think it's so crucial that he's not an academic. He is a staff member who's mm -hmm. here supporting the university's um, aims. And there are multiple people out there who are, um, let's say, part of the silent majority that we don't even see. Everybody assumes that, um, you know, queer looks a certain way. Yeah. They think that if you're a gay man, you act a certain way, because that's mm -hmm. what they see. Or if you're a, 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 you know, a queer woman, that you can look a certain way, have a certain haircut, dress a certain way, think a certain way. But we are yes. so diverse, right? Exactly. <laughs> Everybody has these assumptions. And it's funny that we come in all shapes and sizes and colors and different things, short hair, long hair, you name it, butch, femme, everything in between, non-binary. We are a very colorful community, more colorful than any flag could ever represent. Yes. And the work you're doing highlights that. I'm, I'm sure you're encountering people from all different walks of life. Some who um, are out, some who are not, some who fit the stereotype, some who completely yeah. know that trend. Yeah. And that's so cool. I and even yeah. Like it's, I think people in general need to know more about that. 
and then read your work. Oh. Well, it's it's all about encounter, isn't it? And about collaborative conversations, similar to what I said earlier, we can't say I my re experience represents everyone's experience, not at all, but we need representation and we need spaces where voices are being heard. You know, I one of my favorite quotes I once heard from a wonderful activist whose name I forgot, <laughs> it's awful. Um, but the quote was, um, don't be the voice for the voiceless, pass on the mic. And I love that. And I think speaking about Cambridge and privilege and whom it's for, you know, creating spaces where we share and give away some of the privilege for more representation to happen, for more people to benefit, you know, yeah. Well, so that privilege piece is, I'm glad you brought that up. It is a privilege to be here. We're very fortunate. Yes. I mean, we are surrounded by people who, many of whom come from privileged backgrounds where you do tend to have more, let's say, open-mindedness, more um, access to resources, a greater opportunity to be out if you so choose, um, and resources to fall back on that uh, others may not. Um, people who are in fear of being rejected by their families might stay um, kind of suppressed because they worry that they won't have anything if they are outed or come out themselves or try to live their true lives. But you're right, we live in that privilege, but we shouldn't let it blind us. Mm -hmm. Use it as a enabler for us to be able to help others. And it's so true, it's a, privilege comes in many forms. We often talk about this privilege, male privilege or white privilege, et cetera. There's straight privilege, but there's also a socioeconomic privilege. So there's multiple um, facets to privilege. And yeah. None of us are exempt from having to check our privilege at the door. And mm -hmm. I think that's, I love that quote. <laughs> you know, don't be the voice for the voiceless, pass the mic. Yeah. So it's kind of like what I was saying earlier too, wedge that door open. And yeah, okay, just yeah. because you're there and you've made it through those barriers, that's good for you. How are you going to pay it forward to the next person yeah. coming up?